So now we're going to talk about a new program uh, that was started by the agency in the late 80s, the Nuisance Alligator Program, the Mississippi Alligator Management and Control Program to be specific, was started back in 1989, shortly after the alligator was taken off the endangered species list in 1987. Uh, in 1988, the Mississippi legislature uh, officially granted management uh, authority to the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fishers, and Parks. Shortly thereafter, the Mississippi Alligator Management Control Program was begun, mainly for the purpose of providing a means of management of nuisance alligators where chronic nuisance alligator conditions existed. And at the time, that was primarily in the Gulf Coast region, Jackson, Harrison, and Hancock County, and then also around the Jackson area, around Ross Barnett Reservoir and the Pearl River. Uh, obviously, over time, uh, that has expanded. And these, this program's purpose was that if alligators existed uh, in a nuisance condition, in other words, where they were either preying upon uh, pets or livestock, had lost fear of human activity, actually approaching humans, or alligators showing up simply at the wrong place at the wrong time, like showing up in your yard or in a swimming pool or uh, laying on the highway or in a parking lot, all these different types of scenarios. Uh, it gave our agency the authority to go capture and remove these alligators. In the early years, uh, a lot of these alligators were captured, uh, removed, and relocated. But uh, that became inefficient uh, over time. And we began to use the resource of agent alligator trappers. These are private individuals who are licensed and commissioned through the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks to assist the agency in removal of nuisance alligators. Uh, they are allowed to capture, remove these alligators, and actually commercially dispose of those alligators so that they are not a wasted resource. Um, we have learned over the years, particularly most recently with a trapping and tagging program that I developed in 2007, where we would actually go out, catch and tag alligators. Some of those were alligators that were being relocated. Some of those were alligators we specifically targeted in areas where the hunting season was open to catch and tag alligators, release them, uh, keep GPS information about the location where they came from, uh, keep information about their length and sex in hopes of obtaining some information about the growth of alligators, maybe how much alligators move around, uh, and even something about life expectancy of some of these alligators. So with the Nuisance Alligator Program, uh, has been a help in that tagging program as well. So early on, after we started tagging alligators in 2007, uh, once got a phone call or report about an alligator. It was located at the Timberlake Campground on the Ross Barnett Reservoir. It was the campground manager. Uh, I had been there just a few weeks before and he explained to me, uh, there's an alligator back at the campground. Uh, he'll be easy for you to find. He's in the exact same location as the last one that you caught here. Uh, and he said, by the way, it looks like it has some kind of a yellow tag in its tail. And uh, I quickly flipped through my notes because at the time I had only tagged a, a dozen or so alligators in the last month. And uh, I said, if you got a pair of binoculars, go and look at it and see if by chance it has a yellow tag with the number 70 on it. And he called me back and he said, indeed it does. And this was the same alligator that I had removed from that location. It was about a seven foot male um, that we had taken some 13, 14 miles up the river, up the Pearl River Basin and turn loose in some backwater area. And in the course of about 27 days, a minimum of 27 days, it had traveled all the way back to the same location, exact same location. And so uh, we've since received numerous occasions uh, where this tagging of alligators has provided us vital information about the movements of alligators. We even have one incidence where we've been able to uh, verify the movement of an alligator all the way to uh, Lake Chico, Chico, uh, Arkansas. The alligator moved over 52 miles, as by our estimations, uh, through the waterways to get to that location. Uh, other numerous locations of alligators moving 10, 15, 20, 30 miles. Uh, so 
This is some really neat information, and we do rely upon you to get that information back to us. We hope you'll report it. In addition to the tagged alligators, um, there was a research project that began with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks and the Mississippi State University Wildlife and Fisheries Department in 2010. We radio tagged uh, adult male and female alligators uh, over the years. There was a, or over the, from 2010 to 2012, we tagged and radio collared about 40 alligators. Um, most of those were adult males. And so it is possible that if you were to harvest an alligator uh, on the Pearl River, north of Ross Barnett Reservoir, you may actually uh, harvest one of those alligators that uh, previously had a radio transmitter on it, and we would vitally like to get uh, the information on those alligators. Uh, th over 30 of those adult alligators were over seven feet long. There were 18 males, 12 females in the initial project, and 13 of those alligators were over 10 feet. Five of those were over 12 feet long. Now, since that time, a number of those alligators have been harvested, and we've been able to use that information to get back uh, to those hunters. In the initial years, the radio transmitter was attached just behind the head on those four very large osteoderms that are located on the neck. Uh, and we quickly learned that that was not a good, efficient place to place the transmitter because these males being so uh, aggressive during the breeding season, uh, we found uh, in our very first three weeks of putting transmitters out, that about 70% of those transmitters were torn off during the breeding season. And so we changed our methods by putting the radio transmitter uh, in the trough between the scoots of the tail, uh, which provided a good bit of protection. And you see those pictures uh, on the screen. From that tagged and radio collaring information, uh, there was some information that we knew was out there that we expect such as female alligators don't move as far as the male alligators. Uh, you can see in this one photograph, uh, this is yellow 437. Uh, she is a female seven feet, two inches long. That white line that you see there depicts 100 yards in distance. And each of those little yellow markers indicates a weekly location of that alligator during the summer. Uh, obviously, she's a nesting female and she doesn't range very far. Uh, but you also have uh, records of large male alligators, such as yellow 441, who's a 12 foot, three inch male. And you notice, again, the white line depicting 100 yards in distance. But you see that that alligator has moved around quite a bit more. And then also yellow 442, a 12 foot, two inch male. Uh, this is an alligator that I myself had gotten numerous visual uh, observations of before we ever were able to capture him and tag him. And I had the assumption that the alligator only occupied a certain area because that's the only place that I ever saw him. But after we got the radio transmitters and saw the locations where he was found, uh, we knew that his home range extended about five to six square miles uh, around that area where I had seen him. We did get some records of some alligators traveling as much as 16 miles during that radio telemetry project. And um, a lot of that information uh, is available through the master's thesis of the graduate student who worked on that project. There are several hundred alligators a year that the agency actually goes to nuisance calls for action to actually remove those alligators from properties or locations, no matter what the case may be. There are hundreds of more additional nuisance complaints that take place every year that do not necessarily require action from the department. And that is part of our education process. As people call to complain about alligators, uh, we have the opportunity to explain their value in the ecosystem, uh, evaluate the actual situation that exists with that particular alligator and that location, make a determination of whether action needs to be taken. But on average, two to 300 alligators a year are captured and removed and euthanized as a result of nuisance complaints. Now getting back to the tagging program, uh, since 2007, uh, the agency has tagged and released uh, in the neighborhood of 800 alligators across the state. Most of those tagging efforts occurred 
on the Pearl River near the Ross Barnett Reservoir since that was the first location of our first alligator hunting opportunity in 2005. We also did a lot of tagging in the Pascagoula River Basin and then we do quite a bit uh, in the uh, Vicksburg, Warren County area around Eagle Lake and Terra Wildlife uh, facility. What we do is capture the alligators, get their information, length and sex, we get some other biological measurements. We place a tag on their tail, which is nothing more than a cattle ear tag placed halfway down the length of the tail. Each tag has a unique color and a unique number uh, so that it can be visualized from a distance in order to maybe identify a specific alligator. They also receive a metal clip tag that goes in the webbing of the hind feet. Now the metal clip tag and the webbing usually uh, lasts a little longer and re is retained more so than that plastic tag in the tail. Uh, although we do have some records of those plastic tags in the tail uh, still remaining in the alligator up to 10 years now. Um, so if you happen to catch uh, an alligator during your alligator hunt, uh, we'd like for you to be sure and check for those tags and report that back to us. Be sure and check the hind feet uh, for that metal tag that is in the uh, webbing of the hind foot. It'll have a unique number on it. It also has our phone number and obviously you can contact us by phone. You can contact me by email and report the information on, al on that alligator. We'd like to know the length of that alligator. We'd like to know an exact location where it came from. And from that, uh, we will provide you with a certificate. Uh, just like when duck hunters harvest a banded duck, uh, you can turn that banned information in to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they will send you back information about the history of that duck. Uh, we will do the same thing with your alligator. We'll send you back as much information as we have about when it was originally caught, where it was caught, if it was relocated, where it was relocated to in comparison to where you caught and harvested your alligator. And that's been very helpful information. Uh, the information from this tagging program has actually had a lot to do to change our policy about relocating alligators. We've known uh, from conservation officer reports over the decades that they believe that some of these alligators that were being relocated uh, were, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, repeat customers. Uh, these were alligators that they thought were coming back to the exact same place, sometimes in very short order. Uh, but because alligators are so difficult to identify one unique individual from another, without the tagging program, this was almost impossible. Uh, we now have records of alligators uh, traveling as much as 30, 35 miles uh, from a relocated location back to the exact same location where it originally came from. We also have uh, information of alligators uh, doing so in very short order. Uh, sometimes uh, alligators moving uh, five miles back to the original location within three days, uh, back to the original location where it came from. So uh, we know that this makes a very inefficient use of our uh, resources and it's not good for the wildlife as well. And so we found now that uh, our relocation policy basically is that any alligator uh, over four feet will not be relocated. Our agency policy has always been any alligator over six feet would not be relocated just simply because of the danger that exists not only for our personnel but also for the alligator. Relocating alligators, particularly during their southern months without their proper equipment, uh, can be very dangerous and it can be lethal to an alligator in short period to have them out of the water in an area where it can overheat quickly. And so now we find that most of the alligators, uh, unless they're four feet long or smaller, uh, we do not relocate those alligators. So if you're a private landowner, uh, if you're driving down the highway and you encounter an alligator in the highway, you can always call an uh, emergency phone number and they will contact us and we will send agents uh, with the Department of Wildlife or our agent alligator trappers to come to that location and remove the alligator. Uh, if it's causing obstruction to highways or obstruction or danger to uh, people, uh, if they're on your property in a private pond and they have lost fear of people, uh, any alligator that has been fed, which is illegal by the way, for obvious reasons, 
Every state in the country that has an alligator population has a law against feeding alligators. The obvious reason is that if you feed alligators, they begin to associate that feeding source uh, with human activity. And once they do that, they lose the fear of people and may actually approach people who are unknowingly in the area without knowledge that the alligator is there and obviously no knowledge that an alligator is being fed. And so if you've ever seen videos of alligators coming out of the water, walking up onto the land and going towards people, going towards fishermen, uh, it's usually a result of people who have been there feeding alligators. Now sometimes that feeding is a direct uh, impact by people actually bringing food resources, uh, throwing trash and food items out for the sole purpose of throwing it to the alligator and attracting that alligator to come to the food. Um, there are also indirect situations where uh, you may be, you may have a, a fishing pier or boathouse on, on the lake where you live and it also is occupied by alligators. People have the habit of cleaning the fish on their boathouse and discarding of the fish parts back into the water. And if you're in an area where alligator populations exist, they can actually uh, attract alligators to that boathouse and over time they will lose fe uh, fear of that human activity and this becomes a problem. There are also other indirect sources such as people who put out fish feeders uh, at their ponds or at their boathouses or piers uh, for the purpose of feeding fish, which is not a problem. Except, again, if you're in an area where alligator populations exist, the alligators could then become attracted to not only the food that you're putting out, but the fish that are coming to the food. And so we discourage people from using fish feeders in areas where alligator populations exist. Uh, sometimes that problem can simply by solve, be solved by uh, not using the fish feeder for a period of time and the alligator will avoid the area. But uh, that can be a direct problem. And since it is against the law, our conservation officers uh, rely on many phone calls from the public to inform us about people who are feeding alligators. That's very important information to us to let us know who and where and when that type of activity has taken place. Our conservation officers will investigate the situation. We can make arrests depending on the situation, uh, but they will definitely be cited uh, for that uh, violation. Be aware that every nuisance complaint call that comes in, as I said, doesn't necessarily warrant uh, the call for action from the Department of Wildlife, Fishers and Parks. For instance, uh, getting a phone call most often is going to be described as there's an alligator in our pond in our ditch and we fear for the lives of our pets and our kids and our grandchildren in the area and you may ask the person over the phone to describe how big is the alligator. More times than not, it's always going to be somewhere in the vicinity of eight feet long. And when we get there to investigate the situation, uh, we find out that the length estimation is grossly exaggerated. Um, but uh, alligators that are in the wrong place at the wrong time, we will take time to remove those nuisance alligators. Uh, also understand that if you are in a development that has created additional habitat, such as man-made lakes, and it's in the close vicinity of a waterway or a watershed that is home to alligator populations, that alligators will uh, easily travel around the landscape, particularly during the spring and the breeding season, in search of new areas, looking for females. As males disperse uh, in the early spring, searching for new uh, home ranges, they may wind up in these man-made lakes. So. If you have uh, an alligator complaint in an area uh, where alligators have moved into an area that we expect to see alligators on a regular basis, but they are not causing a nuisance. Uh, for instance, our officers come and investigate the situation and the alligator has a natural response to either distance itself, submerge, distance itself to the other side of the lake, uh, then those people in those areas will have to develop some tolerance for alligators being there. And uh, our resources will not allow us to go and remove every alligator that shows up in someone's pond. 
Alligator complaint calls can range from the nine, 10 foot alligator at the front doorstep. Uh, it could be uh, an alligator that is in a roadside ditch along the interstate. I've actually experienced alligator complaint calls where uh, a vehicle collided with a 13 foot alligator on the interstate causing the vehicle to crash and actually overturn multiple times with the uh, driver having to be evicted and carried by air ambulance uh, to the hospital. Um, so these complaints uh, can be very dangerous and be very warranted uh, for our agency to respond immediately. Um, some of these complaint calls can be uh, private landowners as well as uh, complaint calls on public waterways. If you go across the world and you talk to people, particularly children, there are usually two animals in the world that no matter where they live, if they have access to literature or uh, computers and books, uh, there's two animals in the world that almost everybody knows something about, and that's sharks and alligators or crocodiles. And with that has become an unwarranted fear of alligators and even sharks. But we'll talk particularly, particularly about alligators in that Hollywood has done a very good job of depicting alligators as man-eaters, as this animal that if you were to encounter it, uh, it's going to do its very most best to come after people in an attempt to attack you and eat you. And that is by far not the truth. Alligators will absolutely avoid people. They avoid human activity until we get into a situation where humans intervene by feeding and things like this. Now, you will find that in some populations where there is an increased amount of recreational activity by humans, whether it's boating, fishing, uh, water skiing, camping, and these types of things, that some alligators have a reduced fear of humans and a tolerance of human activity. But all in all, alligators will avoid people. And because of this unwarranted depiction of alligators, um, it, it draws a good bit of fascination. And so when our people respond to these alligator complaint calls, it usually draws crowds. When an alligator is blocking a road, it draws crowds. And the first thing we have to do is assure the safety of the people as well as the alligator. And so alligators that wind up in the roads, you know, we have to use vehicles with lights until we can safely get the alligator removed. Uh, if it's in a parking lot or an apartment complex, people tend to gather around them. We have to get the people out of the way. Uh, that's the first and foremost uh, important thing to be done. But as well, there are situations where alligators have attacked humans. Now, there has never been a documented attack of an alligator or a human in the state of Mississippi. We've had multiple incidences where People have been interacting with alligators, either they're trying to catch them, remove them themselves, uh, or pull them out of the roads and things like this, handling them, and they wound up being bit. But that is not an attack. However, uh, other states, particularly like the state of Florida, has had numerous attacks. Uh, I think they're currently up into the vicinity of 100 attacks that have occurred in the state of Florida since the 1940s. Um, a fair number of those, 25 to 30 of those attacks, have been fatal. But the vast majority of those attacks have occurred uh, by people who were uh, in a vicinity where alligators were known to exist. They were in areas where there were signs warning people not to be there. And they were also in areas where people had been feeding alligators. And all of this creates a very bad conflicting situation. Um, most of those attacks have occurred at night with people swimming in the vicinity where alligator populations existed. And like I said, in a, in a vast, a, a large number of those attacks uh, occurred in areas where there were records of people feeding alligators. So I show you some photographs of an actual attack that occurred uh, in 2007 in the state of South Carolina. 
For instance, this individual was in a public recreational area, kind of like a state park. It also had a golf course. There was a recreational pavilion nearby where people were gathered. And this individual had gone diving into a pond that was located on the golf course. There were signs that said, no swimming, beware of alligators, no collecting of golf balls. But this individual went into the pond. Uh, he was subsequently attacked by an alligator. The alligator ripped his arm off. Uh, he was able to get out of the lake and obtain first aid by some people who were there at the nearby pavilion. Luckily, there were a couple of nurses there uh, who were able to stop the bleeding and he survived. Wildlife agents showed up on the scene. They were able to capture and kill the alligator. Um, I even remember hearing this report on the radio myself in 2007. And the reports were that the wildlife agents had caught the alligator, killed it, and they had removed the man's arm from the alligator's belly in an attempt to uh, take it back to the hospital so that it could be hopefully reattached to the human. Uh, I can tell you that that is not going to happen. Uh, the pH of an alligator's stomach is somewhere between 1.7 and 2.3. That's real close to battery acid. Uh, the metabolism of an alligator is pretty high. Their digestion rates are very high. Once they consume flesh and even bone, uh, it can be reduced to basically a water substance within hours. And so, um, and also know that the mouth of an alligator is only so wide. Their throat is only so wide. So an alligator cannot take a prey item and necessarily swallow it whole unless it can get it swallowed through that small gaping area of the throat. Most of the time, alligators, if they take prey that is too large to swallow whole, they will stash it. For instance, a beaver carcass. Uh, they will take it and stash it many times underwater, uh, under floating vegetation or in a log jam. And they will come back to that carcass as it begins to decompose. And they will tear off and roll uh, what we call the death roll as they tear off pieces of flesh and bone from that carcass so that it is in uh, manageable sizes to be able to be swallowed whole.